Mary Akers first kept hermit crabs when she lived in Florida in the late 1990s. Later, she lived among them in the Turks and Caicos Islands and was thrilled by the sounds that their clacking shells made as they emerged in the evening to begin their nightly forage. Many years later, after she became an empty nester, a friend and fellow pottery enthusiast offered her the last remaining hermit crab that had belonged to their daughter. Strangely drawn to the idea of keeping hermits again, Mary accepted the single crab, but told her husband she would only be temporarily crab-sitting. And isn't the first sign of a rapidly developing obsession denial? She proceeded to research crab care online and found that everything she thought she knew about their care was wrong. She fixed things daily and her colony grew to two, and then four, and then six, and then more. The tank size grew to a 55 gallon on loan and then a 120 tall found on Craigslist. By that time, Mary was completely hooked on the beauty of a well-built crabitat and the strange, mysterious moves of its inhabitants. She read about successful breeding attempts in the HCA forum, and when she discovered that her crab had eggs, she knew she would have to try giving the babies a shot at life. Four years and nine attempts later, she has successfully brought more than a thousand baby hermit crabs to land and created a breeding program that with the help of Land Hermit Crab Owners Society is slowly changing the captive bred hermit crab industry. These simple methods that follow are her attempt to get others successfully breeding land hermit crabs too. Please welcome my mother, best friend, and favorite crab lady, Mary Akers. Since Cenobita clypeatus are the most common crabs in the United States, I'll be sharing the methods that I developed for raising them. If you plan to raise Zoe of other species, you can visit my website, maryacres.com, to see how I have adjusted the parameters for raising zoe of other species. In late 2019, my Cenobita clypeatus spawned twice, a month apart. After the first spawn ended, with over 390 making it to land, I decided to try using the simplest, least expensive equipment possible with the second spawn to see how they fared. One of my main goals has always been to encourage others to give raising hermit crabs a try. So that's the basis for this talk. Breeding 101. Simpler methods anyone can try. The super simple chrysal is made from three items, an empty 10-gallon aquarium, an empty 5-gallon water jug, and a tube of 100% silicone. First, measure the tank back to front, accounting for the black plastic lip, and cut away the top portion of the water bottle at that measurement. I leave the bottom of the bottle intact because it keeps the structural integrity of the water bottle, which bears the weight of the water better and doesn't go off round, although you can see mine went a little oblong, it still works and has held up for three breeding seasons. Be sure to cut out an area around the handle as an opening for feeding, siphoning, and water changes. The PVC pipe you see at the bottom was used to give the bottle a little extra support while siliconing and ensure good water flow uh, when in use. I use a dry erase marker to identify where the bottom of the bottle will sit first. Silicone that curve, then slide the bottle in, otherwise you can't get your silicone under. Use tons of silicone and be sure to smooth it um, as flat as possible on the inside because the Zoe, little microscopic Zoe, can hide in there or get trapped in there and drown. I cut a couple of small shims from the PVC pipe to help push the solid bottom of the bottle forward against the glass while it was while the silicone was drying. You can see one in the bottom picture in the top right. It's it's just still in place. To get your chrysal operational, you will need a small aquarium air pump, a length of airline tubing, and a small air stone. A grow light of any variety is helpful, not required, but it will make a difference and an aquarium heater with a um, thermostat that you can adjust the temperature as needed. I attach the heater to the side wall of the 10-gallon tank and it heats the surrounding water 
uh, well without overheating the bottom where the zoe sometimes sit and can uh, develop too quickly. I kept a floating aquarium thermometer on the far side of the chrysal away from the heater for a reading of the distal water temperature. The following additional supplies won't cost very much, uh, but they'll make your life a lot easier. You'll want a strip of plexiglass or glass to keep salt water from hitting your light um, from the bubbler splash. And that also will slow evaporation, particularly if you are, end up doing this in the cooler months. For siphoning out wastewater, you'll want a large bucket with a small container inside of it. Uh, if water goes over the rim, it's still being collected in the larger bucket and no zoe are lost. A larger bucket is also a lot more stable on a chair, but the smaller container is more manageable to pull out and um, uh, you want one that's a white because it helps you in having contrast against the Zoe for when it's time to remove them. My preferred siphon really is a length of clear airline tubing with a plastic straw at one end for rigidity and I just use rubber bands to secure that. The large aquarium is useful when you want to take every, the large aquarium siphon is useful when you want to take everything out and clean the tank but it isn't required. You'll want to replace the used water with water um, at the perfect parameters and you get that by having a holding tank that contains filtered, aerated, and appropriately warmed water. Um, I kept a simple salinity meter inside the water too which was helpful um, for to show me big swings. I still used a spectrometer but again simpler methods just use the cheaper one. To replace the Zoe, you shine a bright light on one side of your smaller container, use a pipette to pick them up, and return them to the Chrysler. I found it helpful to put them into a smaller uh, measuring cup, and when, that, when I was all done, just pour that back into the Chrysler all at once. It was a little smoother and probably less stressful for them as well. A cooler temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit for Clypeatus seems to yield the highest rate of survival. Caribbean larvae also prefer a relatively high salinity of 35 parts per thousand. The Caribbean, where most of our Cenobita Clypeatus originate, has higher salinity levels than many other parts of the ocean, especially during mid to late summer when most spawning occurs. Any ocean salt mix sold for saltwater aquariums will work. I prefer reef crystals because they have a slightly higher mineral calcium content, which seems to help with molts. Do be aware, though, that if you're aiming for 35 parts per thousand of salinity, you will need to mix your water more concentrated than the directions on the box because those yield a reading closer to 31 or 32 parts per thousand. I use a squirt of prime in each two gallon bucket as I mix. I found there really is no need to measure it by drops. Um, it doesn't affect the zoe in any way if they get a little more in there, but you're certainly welcome to measure if you prefer. Full spectrum light given 12 hours a day seems to be sufficient. The zoe do sink to the bottom without light, but they rise again in the morning with no apparent ill effects. It isn't necessary to feed all of the foods on this list, but I do believe that the more well-rounded you can make their diet, the healthier your zoe will be. First on the list is Nanochloropsis, a beneficial microalgae. You can order it ready to feed online. Mercer of Montana is the brand that I like the best. Or you can culture it. It will keep in the fridge for several months as long as you remember to invert it daily. Marine Snow, Two Little Fishies brand, mimics the blend of inorganic matter that can be found drifting down through the water column, typically eaten by small planktonic organisms. Instant Baby Brine Shrimp, Ocean Nutrition brand, works great, especially for the very first food. It stays suspended in the water well, but you only want to feed a very small amount. The Spirulina and Chlorella can be any brand, powdered, human food grade, Phytoplan by Two Little Fishies is a blend of various phytoplankton that is sold for feeding corals and other inverts. 
Gonio power, also by Two Little Fishies, contains a variety of zooplankton, also used for feeding corals, invertebrates, and filter feeders. I also offer freshly hatched live brine shrimp. I like the San Francisco Bay brand. They have a really good hatch rate and the eggs are very clean with little to no detritus or dirt in them. The sinking shrimp and lobster pellets are mostly fed in the transition tank after the zoe have become megalopa and developed claws. The pictured brand is National Geographic which has since gone out of, has been discontinued. Um, Omega-1 will be a good substitute for that. The eggs start out a bright orange, but they gradually turn gray during the month-long brood. What you're seeing is the yolk sacs being consumed and then their little beady black eyes growing um, to make the gray color. They burst open immediately upon hitting the salt water. If your crab happens to spawn in the fresh water, the zoe will hatch, but they die instantly. Um, as soon as healthy zoe are hatched, uh, hatch, they begin to swim. So in the bottom photograph, you can see um, the, what looks like small bubbles on the, on the right-hand side of that photograph are uh, zoe swimming around. I also have a very small 75-degree heater in there to warm the water. It isn't necessary for the zoe, I've found, but it does seem to make the brooding female a little more comfortable going into the water to spawn, which is, will be the easiest thing for you. She may drop them on the sand if the water isn't right. She may drop them somewhere you'll never see them. Um, so I just try to make it as comfortable for them as possible. This is a close-up shot of a uh, day one larval hermit, also stage one. This is from my 2018 spawn. Um, you can see a, a lunch of instant baby brine shrimp in his tummy because his structures are so clear. Um, and beside that is a uh, schematic drawing of a day one larvae from a scientific paper which I credit beneath it. This is a workable, rough schedule for doing as little as possible. 7.30 a.m. or so, turn on the lights, feed instant baby brine shrimp, wait about a half an hour, do a 50% water change. At that point, you add live artemia, nanochloropsis, and spirulina. At noon, feed instant baby brine shrimp again, some marine snow, and phytoplan. At 5 p.m., feed chlorella, gonio power, and instant baby brine shrimp. At 7 p.m., uh, do a 50% water change. Uh, add nanochloropsis for night, uh, live artemia, and some marine snow, which I believe the artemia also eat the marine snow, um, but it's all eventually getting to the zoe. At 7.30, turn the lights out and go have a drink. The timing of um, these stages are all approximate, as some will transition earlier than average and some later, but each mass shed event takes two to three days for all the larvae to complete the cycle. As my methods have improved, I'm seeing the zoe move more quickly through the larval stages, so this timeline keeps getting updated. Also, species other than Clypeatus have abbreviated larval stages and take much less time to get to uh, megalopa and land. So day four, you can see the first larval shed that tells you they're transitioning to stage two. On day six or before, the gut tracts will be fully developed, which means the pooping starts, so you may uh, want to change water more often. You can just sort of see how that goes. Day eight will bring you the second shed, transition to stage three. Uh, day 11, the third shed, tells you they're transitioning into stage four. Around day 15, you'll see the fourth shed um, going into stage five. All of these are largely invisible changes to the naked eye. Their changes uh, to their structures are pretty um, uh, they're, they're, they're a big deal to them. They're just not something we can see. 
Uh, and the, and after day 15, you hit a period I call the doldrums, which is um, awful. You're going to doubt everything you're doing. They're going to hang out at the bottom. You're going to think you're killing them. Don't, don't try your best not to worry during this stage. Um, just keep your head down. Do the steps. Keep doing the same thing you've been doing, and on or around day 18, you should see the first megalopa, which is very exciting. Um, for mine, the first shell was taken around the 26th day. Um, those first few that walk to land tend to not survive for whatever reason. They're adventurous, but they're foolish, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so don't beat yourself up if the first few come out and then you find them dead. Eventually, um, you'll get a higher success rate as more come onto land. Um, and that usually happens on or around day 28, but that event can keep going for several weeks. So um, don't expect them all to come out at the same time. They, they do develop at different rates uh, and or become inspired to walk out at different rates. Um, so that's just a, a rough outline. Once your megalopa begin to transition, you want to get them out of the chrysal as quickly as you can and into the transition tank. The reason being, the stage 5 Zoe are aggressive cannibals of megalopa, surprisingly, even though the megalopa have the new claws. So you need to get them out of there. I usually f feed first thing in the morning, turn the light on feed, and you will see them start to transition. They transition at that point in the morning with the new light and the feed. And then I use a siphon and I just uh, follow the megalopa around. They swim differently. They're a different color, brighter orange. They're easy to remove. And then you're getting them to the wastewater and then moving them to this transition tank, which is, um, I use this picture even though it's old because it, it conveys the simplicity of the setup. It's only about three inches deep. It's just a plastic bin. I learned later to put the white lid underneath for contrast. Um, and that's a simple ramp um, pre-made from a pet store. I siliconed the holes in it closed with tiny shells so the babies wouldn't fall through anymore on their way out. Um, I lower the temperature in the transition tank, keep it at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. That seems to help keep them from developing too quickly into land hermit crabs, making the final molt and dying. I don't use a heater in the water because I put the transition tank inside of a climate control tank. This is a 55 gallon that I had that was empty. It could also be in a I've done it in as small as a 10-gallon tank with a Zoomed sticker, um, stick-on heater stuck to the back that I just monitored. So it doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to be pretty stable temperature-wise. Um, if they start to climb out without shells naked and do handstands, which they will do, you want to squirt them back into the water. Uh, that's about the best thing you can do for them. I've tried other things, but that seems to work best. Um, when they do come out wearing a shell, I will often take a small piece of bloodworm and set it in front of them. So tiny, I take a toothpick, moisten the toothpick, touch it to the bloodworm, lift it over there. That just gives them a burst of energy on their way out, reaffirms that land is a good place with resources and food, and helps them continue their journey. And you get to feed them their first solid food on land. I also agitate the water regularly. I let the levels rise and fall like a tide. I try to simulate waves in, in the sense of taking a turkey baster and agitating them. The ocean is a turbulent place and even more so when you're trying to exit the ocean. So I'm convinced that a little bit of um, squirting them around, pushing them around, moving them around is not a bad thing. I think it helps tell them um, or activate some biological urge to get out of there and get onto land.
Your megalopa cannot choose a shell until you have first chosen shells for them. And you're not a hermit crab, so how do you know what to pick? This was actually the trickiest, or at least one of the trickiest parts of this process. You really don't want to get them all the way to megalopa and then not have appropriate shells for them. They can't survive, and it's, it's very frustrating and disheartening and sad if they can't walk out uh, wearing what they need. So as you can tell from the insert uh, inset picture here, the best shells will be very, 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 very small. As a general guideline, I tell people they will need to find shells that are small enough to fit under the tip of your fingernail. Uh, many of mine chose a minute whelk, larval, larval whelk shells. They had been painstakingly removed from a whelk egg casing. Um, they're still picking those, um, and they just they really like it. They're super light and almost um, see-through. If you do a search on Etsy for Sailor's Valentine's shells, you might find very small ones that can be useful. Um, most of the babies that I've raised seem to also like the long, tiny spiral shells that you can find as a component in coral sand. Um, I've also used the small pink shells from the Philippines called Melissa shells. Again, they will all seem small, but you want the smallest of the small. The, the, the regularly small ones will be for when they're older. Um, so you'll have to pick through e each batch. You might get a handful. Um, Nerites will come very small, but none of my purple pinchers, maybe three out of you know 600, have taken a nerite shell. Um, so you can try those as a last resort if that's all you've got. But mine never really liked them very much. Um, but remember, the very, very tiniest shells you can imagine. I don't actually have any prepared notes for this slide because it sort of takes my words away every time I look at it. But to the left is a very small clam shell with um, some shells for them to take once they're on land, still incredibly small. And the right side shows you how very small that sh first shell is, especially in the, p the case of what this one picked. And he's getting a grip on the ridges of my fingerprint. The whorls on the end, on the surface of my fingers, are a gripping surface for him. So there's your shot of per perspective. Just a couple baby pictures for your enjoyment. The one at 11 o'clock on the dial is one that has just walked out of the water uh, up the ramp. You can see the ramp in the background. He's clinging to a very tiny piece of sphagnum moss. The one below him is 106 days old on my palm. You can see the ridges there. To the right of that is one of the captive bred babies that was adopted out to Sherry Wordabaugh. He's uh, not quite a year old there, uh, maybe less even. To the right of that, two small uh, captive bread babies in periwinkle shells munching on a piece from, the, from a, a larger crab, a, not a hermit crab, a land crab. The tiny inset picture is... Not a very good picture, but it's hard to photograph a larval whelk that is so small and translucent. But you can see the little eyes of the baby and his legs sticking out. And above that is the baby on the sprout, which I've sort of made the uh, unofficial picture of CrabCon 2020. Uh, that's a clover sprout, and I just threw the seeds in there. It sprouted. Lo and behold, one of the babies climbed all the way to the top of that minute sprout and perched up there very proud of himself and posed for a picture.
these are just some quick stats of um, survival from birth to walking on land. The female uh, C. clypeatus can lay up to um, 10,000 eggs. She broods the eggs in her shell for roughly a month, keeping them warm, turning, and fluffing them. She migrates to the ocean to spawn in the salt water. C. clypeatus zoe pass through five free-swimming larval stages and one glaucotho or megalopa stage. Of the 10,000 original hatchlings, Many will die or be eaten, both in the open ocean and in our tanks. Approximately 20% of the original will make it to stage 5. Roughly 10% of the original will make it to megalopa stage. And out of the approximately 10,000 that spawned in my tank, 390 um, took shells and walked onto land to take their first breath of air. What's next? Well, uh, we have exotic species now. I have in, in my uh, exotics tank, I have Cenobita perlatus and Cenobita lila. Um, no, no correct spawns yet. I have seen eggs at least once for the perlatus. Um, even better, though, we took a huge step forward in the breeding program this summer when Kelly Kurtz, a keeper who lives about five to six hours away from me, she got some mis mystery Zoe in her tank that were perhaps Viola, perhaps Perlatus, also perhaps Ecuadorans or Clypeatus, but less likely, we believe, because of the eventual larval stages that they went through. So I brought, she, we met and transferred the Zoe, no small feat. Um, but it's very nice because now that tells me that I don't have to raise every species. Um, I don't have to keep every species I want to raise. If people have Zoe that are exotic species that are near enough to me that we can meet, I can take those off their hands if they don't want to do it and try to give a shot at life to uh, their Zoe. So we're, we're working through that whole process and, and what um, the obligation is on both ends, but um, it's a really exciting uh, step forward. So I have these mystery Zoe now that are still way too small to tell the species, but I'm hopeful they will be uh, turn out to be violas. So also, we I'm hoping to streamline the process, which I am doing. Uh, this talk is evidence of that, but I'll continue to keep doing that in the interests of getting lots of people to try. Uh, along with that is creating a roadmap for others, um, again, as evidenced in this talk. Encouraging more hobbyists to try. Uh, I can work with people remotely. Um, local to me in Buffalo is uh, a woman who's going to take Brianna Schmidt. She's going to take any of the Clypeatus Zoe that I get this summer since I'm trying to focus on exotics. And she, with some help from me, is going to give it a shot and, and see what her results are and, and keep track. Um, so that's, that's really mostly it. Um, Hermit House is growing. Oh, and, and definitely adopting out the babies from 2019. I have very many, very, very many. More than I can have, more than I want to have more than I can keep long term even because of size restrictions. So this whole process, as miraculous and wonderful as it is and, and how you may think it's great, it only works if people like you on the other end uh, adopt the babies and value them and teach other people to value them and um, help keep the process going. I can breed babies till my eyes fall out. Um, but if I don't have anyone who values them enough to adopt them and pay the adoption fee and um, cherish them, then all my efforts are to not, and I have to stop breeding. I can't just, I don't want to give these babies to pet stores. So our adoption program through the Land Hermit Crab Owner Society is where you start. 
Um, and we can work with you if your conditions aren't quite right. We can work with you to get them to uh, good conditions. Also, babies come with a starter kit. There's clay supplies for food, dishes, water dishes, ramps. They've grown up on those. They're very used to them. They come with starter foods. They come with starter shells. It takes away a lot of the worry and guesswork for you. We also have a Facebook group for people who have adopted these babies, and you can get support from other people when you're, you're feeling anxious or having questions. So um, it's in all of our best interests and in the crab's best interests if breeding works long term. So the way to do that is to support the program um, and give these babies homes. And finally, the thank yous. Um, first attempt to record this took 10 minutes, so I'll keep it brief. Thank you to Stacy Griffith for believing in this mission, supporting it, giving me the um, uh, behind-the-scenes help that was necessary um, with Anna Keel, who has run the adoption program from the start, who is amazing. Um, she adopts out adult hermits. She's She's vetted every single baby adopter, which is something I just can't take on in addition to everything else, and I trust her implicitly, and we haven't had um, any losses in shipping of babies, and, and very few after the fact as well. Rosemary Saneri also works on the adoption um, uh, team and helps to vet adopters. Uh, Jeannie Singhass has, oh, was the one who picked all those larval whelk shells out of the casing, and her lichen and moss are the first thing that the babies get moved to on land when they come out of the water. I, I set them very gently onto those products of hers. Courtney Carr, Choya Queen, now Bioac Bioactive FX, is, um, has been a great supporter from the start. She adopted a ton of babies. She's keeping track of them, monitoring them, um, seeing how they grow. Shadow Hafner um, from the HCA was the very first person to really inspire me to try this. She took beautiful, gorgeous pictures. She sent me a bunch of tiny turbo shells that she had used in her attempts that she picked off the beaches of Alaska, painstakingly made sure they didn't have holes in them. So uh, that was incredible. Stacy Bolts, my Florida connection, has gotten me a ton of shells, baby, tiny baby shells that I've then picked through. She's been great emotional support all along the way. She's given it many tries. She's going to be the next one if anyone is, uh, if she keeps at it. <laughs> um, Kelly Kurtz, again, I mentioned we she traded the Zoe, um, and she's an adopter. Came to CrabCon last year, big supporter. Leonard Pratt's my husband. He gets a shout out just for all that he puts up with all the long days and and uh, my dealing with me as I'm stressing and worrying <laughs> over the babies. Crab Street Journal, Land Hermit Crab Owners Society, all the members of those organizations have been very helpful. The adopters of the 2018 babies, the very first pioneers to take this on, and the adopters in 2019 so far who have stepped up to uh, to help this this venture succeed. Carol Ann Orms, uh, who is an inspiration with Jonathan Livingston Crab, almost 44 years old now, in or 44 years in her kept in captivity with her. And big huge shout outs to the pioneers who have succeeded in breeding before me. Curls in Germany, Natalie in Australia, Daniela in Germany, and Sue Brown in Australia. You inspire me, and I am standing on your backs, if that's how that's said. So thank you, everyone. Um, I know we're only halfway through CrabCon at the time of you hearing this, but... Uh, I'm excited. I, 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 I love this group. Thank you for participating, and go CrabCon!